and that's it. Okay. Okay. Uh, you need the microphone. Yeah. Yes. You need the microphone. Because, uh, like it's a uh, uh, to 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 io, vabbè, io sento, non so se sentono loro. Perché stanno scappando tutti, Matteo? Perché stanno scappando? <ride> L'effetto. <ride> ok, eh, ha bisogno di altro? No, è solo ecco. lavagna, sì, eh, quindi dalle luci sono cioè, certe. Sono qui, le luci sono queste, forse così. Uh, sì. Stanno scappando tutti. <ride> Okay, so first of all, you have to sign this machine, so just... Ah, already? Okay, fine. Is it written somewhere? Ah, yeah, okay. Ah. <laughs> okay, so good morning. So I'm Maurizio, and in these two weeks, I would like to present some uh, interesting aspects of non-equilibrium dynamics in uh, quantum statistical systems. So as you can see, I will talk about quantum mechanics and, uh, and not the quantum mechanics of a single particle, but quantum mechanics of many particles, as you can infer from here. And then, OK, so, so this means that okay, the first two or three lectures will be just about, the, uh, about quantum mechanics and the, uh, what happens when you have to describe many, uh, many, a many body system. So uh, what can we do? And uh, they will be, uh, they will cover just the stat uh, um, just static aspects of the, uh, of the problem. Then, okay, in the next uh, lectures, we will consider the non-equilibrium time evolution of these of this systems. So in particular, well, today will be about quantum statistics. And uh, we will start considering the, the simplest model that I can imagine, uh, simplest quantum mechanical problem which is the well, uh, system described by uh, Hamilton of a single spin. Okay. First of all, I guess you already know what is a quantum spin. Hmm? So, okay, spin was, well, in the 20s, it was recognized that the particles have uh, intrinsic de degrees of freedom, uh, which is called a spin. Then when you consider interaction between different particles, you have also to take into account the interaction between spin, the spins of the particle. So you can have a spin-spin interaction. You can have an interaction between the spin and an external magnetic field. You can have an interaction between the spin and the angular momentum. Okay? So if you want to describe a system, you have to take into account all these kinds of interactions. But now, okay, today we just consider, uh, we simplify the problem, and we only consider the, uh, the spin degrees of freedom. So we describe spin Hamiltonian today. And so, uh, well, a quantum spin uh, satisfies the same uh, algebra of the angular momentum. So it satisfies something like this. So you have SI, SG, SL, SN, C for I, Epsilon, L, N, J, SJ. This is the Levy Civita symbol, which is equal to 1 if, okay. Uh, if uh, L, N, and J are order, okay? And then you, it, uh, it is equal to zero if two indices are equal mm, to one another. 
and uh, is equal to minus one if you have to, uh, to, to take a you know, number of permutation to, to get that particular combination. So for example, uh, we will consider just spin one half. Hmm? Spin one half, it means that you can represent the spin by means of Pauli matrices. So you have that the spin can be represented in this way. Sigma L will be equal one, one half. Okay, there is an H bar here probably. And then there is sigma L, okay? Well, this is this matrix, so this is the, the Pauli matrix. Sigma one, also called sigma X, is equal to, can be represented at zero, as zero, one, one, zero. Then you have sigma two, which is also called sigma Y, which is equal to zero minus I, I zero. Then sigma three, which is sigma Z, equal uh, one, zero, zero, minus one. Okay. In the following, we will also use the notation, okay, yeah, the notation sigma zero equal the identity, hmm? which is one, zero, zero, one. You can check that the, the polymetry satisfy this algebra, hmm? okay? And so this uh, Levi Sita symbol is such that if you consider epsilon one, two, three, this is equal to one. Then epsilon two, one, three is equal to minus one because we have to consider permutation between the two indices. Okay. Epsilon and so on, okay, all the various uh, permutation of the indices. And then if you consider every other elements of uh, this tensor, then it is equal to zero. Epsilon, for example, epsilon one, one, two, so when we have two equal indices, this is equal to zero and so on. Okay, so this is just the algebra of the spin. Something you should, you probably know. Okay, now let's consider this uh, very simple uh, Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian of a single spin in a magnetic field. Okay. So let's assume that our system is such that uh, the, uh, the spin tends to align in the direction of the magnetic field. So how can we describe the system? Well, if for example, the magnetic field as in, it is in some direction B, okay? What you have, you can, you can write an Hamiltonian of this form. So the Hamiltonian is minus B scalar sigma. What I mean with this, I mean something like this. It's equal minus sum over all the indices of B, L, sigma L. Why I am saying that this is the Hamiltonian of the system? Because if you compute the ground state of this Hamiltonian that you find that the spin is aligned in the direction of the magnetic field. So this is what we wanted to describe, no? So, well, for example, we could consider, uh, well, just an example, let's do an idea, uh, an Hamiltonian like this, H equal three sigma Z plus four sigma X, which is equal three, four, or minus three. Mm -hmm. So if I'm asking you what is the ground state, you have to diagonalize this matrix to find the ground state. And what you, you find in the end is that the, the state, psi zero, psi ground state, is equal to this, one over square root of five times minus one, two. Okay, this is something that uh, I guess you know very well. And uh, okay, this is kind of boring Hamiltonian also because you could also say that this is a classical Hamiltonian because there is just one spin. So let's try to make it quantum. What can we do with this system? We can carry out a quantum measurement, okay? A projective measurement. So what happens if we prepare the, the state in the ground state of this Hamiltonian? So we are in this particular state and then we measure some observable. For example, in the spin in the Z direction. So what happens? Well, we know that if we, uh, if our device follows the, uh, uh, the projective measurement scheme of von Neumann, so we know that the, the state should collapse in one of the eigenstates of, of the observable mm -hmm. with a given probability. So in particular, the, the, we, we measure this observable, the spin in the z direction. This is our observable, sigma z. And so the, uh, which are the eigenstates of this, of this observable? Well, because we chose a base, a base is where the sigma z is diagonal. The eigenstate of sigma z has just 
one zero and zero one. Hmm? So this means that after the measurement, yeah, you're measuring sigma z. After the measurement, you have two possibilities. One is the state becomes one zero, and the other becomes zero one. Okay, it is customary to use some notation here, and the state one zero is usually indicated by up, okay, in the sigma z basis, and the state is denoted by tau, spin tau. Okay, so now, uh, which is the probability that the state uh, collapses in this, into these states, where the probability is just given by the expectation values in the state of the projector on the eigenstates correspond to that eigenvalue. Right? So what I mean the probability here is equal to the expectation value ground state of the projector hap C psi ground state. And here probability of up. The probability of down is this one. Ground state. So what is the projector? On the state, well, here the projector on the state up is simply given by this, this operator, which if you want to represent in terms of two by two matrices, is just, uh, yeah, this operator. Then we have the projector on spin down, which is this, which is this other operator. Is it okay so far? So just to remind you some properties of projectors. Projector squared is equal to the projector itself. Okay. Okay. You already know this, no? I guess. Maybe, okay, I don't know. This is a, a more complicated way to write than what you have already seen. So this is the absolute value of the, uh, uh, of the um, uh, scalar product between the, the state and the eigenstate corresponding to that particular measure. Well, it collapses and so on. And, and the same here, so you have this. Just the same. Okay, so this is what happens after the measurement. And uh, if, you, if we know the probabilities of uh, uh, the outcome of the measurement, then we know everything. We can construct, for example, the, the mean value of the observed that it's measured, and you immediately find out that this is equal to the expectation value of that observable. And we can also, uh, we know the entire distribution of the probabilities, so we can also compute other, uh, other quantities, so, uh, like the variance and whatever of the distribution. Okay, so this just to say that if you, if you, if you know the expectation values of all the observable, of all the projectors, you know everything. But say you can express everything in terms of these expectation values. Okay, let us now do the following. Okay, so far it's, uh, I guess you already know everything about this. But now let's assume that I, I want to take another measurement after this one. And for example, I measure the Hamiltonian. So still you can, uh, you can use the same formalism. So if I was in the spin up, then I compute the expectation value of spin up on the ground state of the Hamiltonian or on the other state, and you compute the probability. Fine, it doesn't change anything. But let's now assume that I, I carry out the measurement, but I, I don't tell you the outcome of the measurement, okay? So I did it, I know. What is the measurement? So I know the state, but you don't. And still, even if you don't know the, the outcome of the measurement, I ask you to, to tell me the probability uh, of whether the state will be in the ground state of the Hamiltonian after the second measurement. Okay? So how do you do this? Well, clearly, you, have, uh, you must consider both possibilities of spin up and spin down, because you don't know in which state is the system. 
So you could say, OK, the system is with probability, with probability equal uh, psi ground state projector up psi ground state. It was in this state up. And the probability p down, c ground state, is in the state down. OK? Now, depending on whether you are in the spin up or spin down, you have different probabilities for the ground state. In particular, okay, I not, yeah. So it means that the, if you want to compute the probability that now, after the second measurement, it's in the ground state, then this will be given by the probability that the state was up. So which means this is the up. And now you must multiply this probability by the probability then the ground state collapses into the eigenstates of the, uh, of the ground state once it was preparing the up state. So you have to put here the, the projector on the ground state. Oh, sorry. You have to put here the the expectation value of the projector on the ground state starting from the spin up. Hmm? Okay. Plus, there is another possibility because you know that the state could have been in the down state. So you have the probability that it was down times. Now the probability that they, after the collapse it will be in the, in the ground state. Hmm? Okay. So if I ask you what is the probability, this is what you have to do. Fine. And uh, okay, you, you have to do the same if I tell you, okay, instead of measuring the grounds, the, the, the Hamiltonian I could also measure other observables, and you should do this kind of calculation. So you see, it is more, it's less elegant than before now, huh? because you have to take into account all, all the conditional probabilities. Hmm? So the fact that before it was in a, in, a, in a state up or down, whatever. And there is something which is not very nice. And the thing is that, uh, well, we would like maybe to use the same formalism as before. So we would like to express everything in terms of expectation values. And in particular, maybe you could wonder whether you can express this kind of probabilities as the, expect as the expectation values, well, in some state that you don't know, or the projector on the, on the ground state. You could wonder whether this is possible. No? Because, okay, we. We have seen before that we can express everything in terms of the expectation values in the state. And now here, maybe well, we would like to do the same and express this probability in this form. The problem is that this is impossible. You cannot do this. Okay? And uh, I invite you to prove it, at least for this simple model. But you cannot express this probability in a way that the state is independent of the operator that you observe in this form. So this shows that there is, that our description wasn't complete. So we start considering just this kind of state, quantum states in this form. But now we see that if we consider a situation where we don't have a complete knowledge of the system, apparently we cannot describe everything in terms of this, in a simple way at least, in terms of the, uh, of the state, of the quantum state. And uh, so OK, it was proposed by von Neumann. Uh, to, to somehow uh, generalize the formalism. And instead of considering, uh, and to introduce a, a, an operator called the density, density operator that allow to, to, to deal with these kind of situations. So the idea is very simple. Because, okay, we let's start again from here. So we know that given a pure state, we can, uh, we can obtain the probability of the after the measurement by computing the expectation value. But now the expectation value of, a, of this projector can actually be written as the trace of the projector on the ground state times the operator projector of a spin up. Is this clear to you or not? that you can rewrite this expression in this form. Hmm? If you don't have a problem, I continue. Okay. 
Okay, this is just, okay, let's, it was, I was just saying, let's assume that you would like to describe these probabilities, these probabilities here, using the same formalism. So now we don't know what is the state of the system after the measurement. So I'm just saying, okay, let's assume that you can, there is a state that you can write, a psi tilde, hmm, such that you can find the same probability. And the problem is that uh, there is not. You cannot find any state that satisfy the constraint, which is a quantum state which gives you the, these probabilities. So it's just an hypothetical state. Sorry? Yes, yes, it is. But we will see in a, in a moment. No. But okay, in, in this simple case, actually, you can prove just by considering, uh, I think it's sufficient to, to consider two different observables, to measure two different observables, and you realize that it's impossible to define this, this state independently of the observable that you measure, I think. But okay, that we'll see why it's true, so in, in a moment. Is it clear? Okay. So okay, what I'm suggesting now is just to rewrite these expectation values in this form. So I, I've done nothing here. Yeah, I just written the same expression in this form. And now I just want to call this projector here a density operator. So you see that, uh, well, as everything can be described in terms of the state, we see that everything can be described in terms of density operator. Indeed, well, we can compute all the expectation values using this operator instead of the state. So I, I didn't do really anything here. But now, let's see what happens when we, when you perform a measurement, okay, for example. So let's assume that we, uh, we measure the, as before, uh, the state in the, in the z direction, and we want to express this probability, the probability of to be in the, in the ground state, for example, after the second measurement. So let's write again what we wrote here. So the probability to be in the ground state is equal to this probability to be up, which is equal to trace of the, uh, okay, uh, yes, okay. The trace of, uh, uh, over the initial state, yes? All right. Of course, let's go. <clears throat> okay. So we have here the probability to be in the ground state is equal to the probability of being in the up state, which is this one ground state, projector on the up state, see ground state, times this object, which is the probability that you are, okay, which is the expectation value in this up state of the projector on the observed that we measure on the particular, on the, uh, on the ground state in this particular case, plus the other expressions, psi ground state, uh, projector down, psi ground state, then you have here down, projector on the ground state, and down. Okay, we found this. But now we can rewrite this expression as follows, as the trace of what? Okay, uh, we write this as the trace of psi ground state. So this term, then here you have a projector on the ground state, up, up, plus this other term, which is psi ground state, projector down, psi ground state, times project on the ground state of down of down down 
Okay. So this is equal to the trace of psi ground state the up psi ground state. Up plus psi ground state, at down, psi ground state, down, down, multiplied by the projector on the ground state. Here I just use the, the cyclic property of the trace. Okay, because you write it here, have the trace of A, B is equal to a trace. B times A, you can check it immediately by writing this expression with the indices. With the so we found this. You see that this expression is very similar to what we have here, because we have expressed everything in terms of the projector on the observers that we, on the eigenstate that we, uh, uh, where the, the eigenstate collapses in the end, projected on the ground state. But now the difference is that instead of having this projector on the ground state, and we have this object here. So we can say that the density matrix, we can define this density operator after the first measurement to be exactly this, this term here. So density operator after the first measurement, so after, uh, after measuring, okay, after, after, measuring after measurement sigma z then we have that the we were in the in the ground state originally then after the measurement we end up in this in this mixed state described by this density operator so rho which is equal to the <coughs> okay just this expression psi ground state the Psi ground state up, up plus psi ground state down down. Okay, just algebra, simple calculation. This is uh, we found that we can describe the state by replacing this projector by this new state. And you can actually check very easily that this is equal to, can be written in this form, can be written as the projector uh, on the, on spin up times the initial state, projector up plus projector down, ground state, C ground state, project on the down spin. Why is this the case? Because when you write this expression, now you remember that the projector on spin up is nothing but this. It's the same here. This is the projector on spin down. And so you realize that you can rewrite this expression in this form. Okay, all I did is just to show you that if we use this new formalism, hmm, where we write this potential value in terms of this, uh, of the density operator, defining this in this way, then we are able to capture also the situation where you, you lack some knowledge about the system. But there is uh, some, some differences between this density operator here and this density operator here. Indeed, here we started from a, a usual quantum state, a pure state. So what we find is that the density operator is just a projector. It's a projector on that state. And if you know that the projector is eigenvalues either equal to one or equal to zero, okay? Instead, if we now consider this operator here, then we easily realize that uh, this is not a projector anymore. And it's simple to check it. We can, for, we could, for example, compute the square of this density operator, and we will find that this is not equal to itself. So it's not a projector. 
Nevertheless, okay, they, these two operators share some properties. So first of all, the trace of, a, of, a project, of this project is equal to one. There is a single state. So if you consider the, so let's consider the two possibilities. So we have the density matrix of the original state, raw ground state, which was equal to psi ground state, psi ground state. And this is what you know very well. Then we have the, the density matrix after the measurement of sigma z. And then we know that this has this expression. Up, raw ground state, up plus p down, raw ground state, p down. Okay, this density matrix, you can see, has a trace equal to one, right? Because the trace of raw ground state is equal to the trace psi ground state, psi ground state, which is equal to the psi ground state, psi ground state, and because this is normalized, it's equal to one. Let's compute the trace of this object here. The trace of this object is equal to the trace of the up raw ground state p up plus p down raw ground state p down. Hmm? Now we use the cyclic property of the trace. So this is equal to the trace of raw ground state p up squared plus plus uh, raw ground state p down squared. Hmm? But now this is a projector. So this means that p up squared is equal to p up. Hmm? And p down squared is equal to p down. So now we have that this is equal to the trace of raw times projector up plus projector down. Hmm? But these are the eigenstates of an observable. So they form a complete basis of the space. So this means that when you sum all the projectors uh, on the eigenstates of, uh, of genetic observables, then you find the identity. So this is equal to the trace of raw, which is equal to one. Okay? So in this example, we are seeing that the body density operator as defined originally, and the density operator after the measurement satisfy this property. The trace of row is equal to one. Then, okay, there are also other properties. For example, it's easy to, to check that the, tra that the eigenvalues of this density operator hmm, are always between zero and one. How can you do this? Well, in this, uh, uh, this kind of simple, for example, you can you can consider the expectation value of a generic state. You can see a generic state, psi tilde. Okay. And then you consider this expectation value of psi tilde times the density operator of psi tilde. Okay. If you show that this expectation value is always between zero and one, then clearly there cannot be again, again states of rho with eigenvalue smaller than zero, larger than one. Okay? And you can actually check that this is the case. Very simple, I leave to you the calculation if you want. But it's, uh, it's something easy to, to prove. Okay, but the, um, so this was just an example. So now I state the, the result so that you, you understand at least the formalism. Okay. So what, Oh, sorry. Sorry. So, well, you want to write it? Okay. I'm saying that the, uh, the eigenvalues of the density operator the eigenvalues are always between 0 and 1. Okay. And in order, well, let's write the eigenvalue in this way, lambda, lambda. Both, in, a, in any case, any case. So every time that you have a density operator, you have these properties. 
and you can check in both cases if this is true. There is no SC. This is a ah, row, yes, okay, yeah. Okay, no. I, uh, there are no S's here. Everything is a row, uh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> this is a row, row, this is closed. <laughs> okay. So when you, when you consider the eigenvalues of this object, then you find that they lie in this interval, zero, one, and you can prove it by considering generic state, generic, you consider generic, generic psi tilde, for generic psi tilde, then you prove that psi tilde rho psi tilde is always between 0 and 1. Hmm? You, you should try to, to prove it, but it's, uh, it's not difficult. So, sorry, repeat. Upper bracket squared or one lambda is just the limits of the uh, domain? Or lambda is between 0 and 1? No, you, you, you yeah. find this. You find this, that this object is always between sorry, 0 and 1. Uh, lambda is between 0 and 1? Uh, yes. Squared, okay. Okay, yes, so yeah, yes, that's right. Yes, that's good. What's the problem? Sorry, I didn't see. So you're saying that, okay, lambda is in the interval 0, 1. Yeah. This is what I... Uh, is included, see, zero, one. It, they are included because, okay, for example, in this particular case of a projector, you have the eigenvalues are equal either to zero or to one. So you have these cases. Okay. But in general, they are just between zero and one. And the trace of the density operator is equal to one. So these are general properties of this density operator that you can prove. Yes. Okay. But, okay, but apart from our specific example, what I mean is that let's assume that you, you don't know which is the state with certainty. So I tell you that you know that the, the, there is a given probability, pi, that the state is, uh, that the system is in the state psi i. Hmm? You only know this. You start from this, okay? Then how can you describe this kind of system? Well, you can describe the system introducing a density operator, which has this form, sum over all the states of the probability, probabilities to be in, in those particular states times the projectors on the state. This is the claim. And indeed, you can prove that if you are interested in the probability of, uh, um, of the outcome of a given measure, you can you can actually compute this probability of uh, the, the measurement such that some operator is equal to, the outcome is equal to lambda for an operator, can be written in this form. So as the trace of the density operator times the projector on this particular state corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda of the observable O. I'm saying for a given observable O, if you make a measurement, this is the probability of the measurement. Since we can compute the probabilities, we know everything about the system. So we can, we can describe our system using this kind of density operator. Okay. So we generalize the notion of the pure states, hmm, the quantum state that you know, where this uh, density matrix is nothing but a projector for pure state. For, so you have, if you have a pure state your state psi, then the corresponding density operator is the projector on that state, rho equal. Mm? But we generalize this to other states, which are called mixed states, that can be written in this form, mm? but can be written in this other form. So you can define this density operator that describes the mixed state. So you define density operator or rho, which differs from this in the fact that it's not a projector. So in this case, you have eigenvalues which are between 0 and 1. 
So in this case, eigenvalues zero or one. Mm? In this case, eigenvalues between zero and one. It's the projector. Yeah, but the, the density operator is defined as the projector on the state. So what I mean is that you can use the same formalism both here and here hmm, to describe, in this case, quantum states, pure states. In this case, more complicated situation where you lack some knowledge on the state. But there is a unique formalism that covers both, uh, both uh, situations. OK? OK, so, uh, so I introduced this density operator as uh, a way to describe this kind of uh, states where you lack some knowledge about the state. Mm? For example, in the, in, the, in the example, you lack the knowledge about the outcome of the measurement. But, but there are other ways to, to lack some knowledge about the state. For example, let's assume that we, we have now a more complicated system with respect to before, which was just one spin. Let's assume that we have a, sp a system of two spins. Now, instead of one. Okay. Two spins. For example, For example, let's consider this state A minus 1 over 3, up, up, plus 2 over 3, down, up, plus 2 over 3, down, down. So first of all, what does it mean, this notation, up, 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 down? I mean that the, in the base, in the sigma z base, hmm, the first spin is in the up direction, so it's, it's equivalent to the vector 1, 0. Mm? And this other spin is in the up direction. So this is our state, 1, 0, 1, 0. And here you have, OK, now maybe I can use different color for the different. OK. Mm. This is the meaning of the notations. Zero one. Zero one. Okay. So the question is: Let's assume that we uh, we can only uh, carry out we can uh, take measurement only on the first spin. Hmm? So that you have a device and uh, we have uh, two spins, but as a matter of fact, you can't ac access the information on the second. Yes. Ah, this is a two, yes, so, okay. Two, oh, well, okay, yeah, yeah. Two. Okay, so uh, as you see, I have some issues, writing issues. <laughs> so, okay, this is two over three, two over three, one over three, you can check that this is a, this is normalized. Okay, four plus four plus one is equal nine, three squared is equal nine. Yeah. So this is, a, this is a quantum state, and the problem is that now we can measure, we can, Measure only observables acting on trigger on the first spin. So what I mean, uh, let's assume, let's, let's assume. 
consider this situation. Okay? What does it mean uh, observers that act non trivial only on the first spin? Well, this observer can be, for example, the spin, the, the, the spin, the first spin in the in the z direction. So you can measure, for example, sigma one z. Hmm? Or you can measure sigma one x or sigma one y. Okay? But you cannot access the other spin. So you cannot measure sigma two z, for example. So you cannot measure this this observer. Okay, this is a two, this is a two x sigma two y. You cannot access these, and you cannot even access this kind of observer, sigma one x, sigma two y, and so on. So you only have information about this. You can only measure these quantities. Because, okay, we lack some information, then you should expect that you can describe the system using a density matrix. And so the idea is that, okay, because we don't care, as a matter of fact, what, uh, uh, what is the state on the second spin, because we cannot access it. So the idea is just to describe the, the reduced space, just the, the state of uh, the, the first spin, using a density matrix. Can we do this? Yeah, is the question. And the answer is yes. Otherwise, we, we would have introduced the density matrix or <laughs> density operator formalism. So, well, uh, how can we construct? this density matrix. So we would like to define an operator, rho 1, with the property that every time that you compute the expectation value of an operator, which act only on 1, a generic operator, on 1, you find the correct probability, the, the correct expectation value, using the original density matrix, rho of one, and now here I'm putting some tensor product identity. What I mean with this, because we are focusing on operator that act non trivial only on one spin, this means that they act like the identity on the other spin. They are not doing anything on the other part of the system. Okay, so the difference is that this spin, this is like a sigma one x, for example, an example of this operator. This operator is sigma one x identity. Is this clear or not? If it is not clear. Hmm? No. OK, yes, OK. When I wrote this condition, OK, uh, okay maybe it's uh, because there is some, I omitted something here. So my fault. When you consider all the operators acting on two spins, the operators can be written always in this form. You can have some Pauli matrix on acting on one spin, and on the other spin you can have a Pauli matrix or the identity, always. So when I say that I can measure all the observables on the first spin, I mean that I'm considering all the observables that act like the identity on the other part. Okay. So this means that I can I take this kind of observables, but I don't I can't measure these other observables. Okay. Because clearly, okay, our space is a space of two spins, so our, our operators act on both spins, always. But now what I mean is that I would like to describe the same system, just ignoring the fact that there is the second spin. And so now I want to, just to consider the spin that act on the first, the, the operator that act on the first spin, and I want to construct a density matrix for the, for the first spin. So this is what I, I would like to find this. Operator, hmm? this density operator, that reproduces the correct expectation values. How can I do this? Okay, uh, well, first of all, I, I have to choose a basis for the space of two spins. Hmm? When you have two spaces, like two spins, the, the basis can be, uh, can be written. If you, if you choose the, a basis for the, for the first spin, uh, let's consider, let's call this space uh, lambda for the first spin. Okay, lambda, oh, all right. lambda first spin, okay, which means a lambda can be either up or down. For example, this is a complete basis for the first spin. Then I can consider a, another basis for the second spin, which is essentially the same. 
as here, but now we know that the state up and down is for the, ah, is for the second spin, up, second spin, down, second spin. Hmm? This is the basis. Then if you want the basis of the entire space, then we have the space of one and two, which is the tensor product of the two bases. So this means that you have all this possibility. You can have up the first spin, up on the second spin. You can have up the first, down the second, and so on and so forth. So oh, oh, this is one. Okay, um, second and down, one down the second. And I'm using, as I did there, I'm using the compact notation up, 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 down, down, up, and down, down. Hmm? When I write this, when I write up, up, I mean this. So it's the tensor product of the two states. This is a complete basis. Hmm? So now, independent of the particular representation, what we have is that when you want to consider a basis of the uh, of two spins or a bigger space, we just have to take the tensor product of the uh, of the of the um, or the basis ele elements of the single spaces. So, <clears throat> so this means that uh, um, when you write the trace, the trace means that we have to to sum over all the expectation values in these elements of the base, because, okay, we know a trace of some observable is equal to the sum over all the state of a complete basis of the space of psi i of psi i, where these are normalized, uh, normalized uh, elements of the basis. This is the definition of the trace. Because we know this, then we can apply this definition to our equation here and see what happens. So we have the trace. Now, clearly these operators act only are defined on the first space. So this is a trace on the, uh, on the space of the first spin. Okay? While here the trace is over both spins. So here we have to use the, the basis of the first spin, which is this one. Here instead we have to use the base of both spin, which is this one. So what do we find? We have trace over the first space of row one. O one is defined by definition equal to the sum over all the space, all the uh, all the elements of the base of mm, so phi. I call this phi. I, that's right, I1, okay. the base row 1, row 1, I1, yes? Yeah. We are considered C1, C1? Yeah. Yes, yes, so in this case, what I mean is that when I write I1, is a complete basis in the space of the single spin. So the first spin, uh, we consider the first spin, spin, hmm? then the complete basis, which is given by up or down. Okay, I just parameterize this by some uh, integer here, which can be zero, one, or up or down, whatever you want. So this is a, a, a just a, a label for the for the elements of the basis. So it doesn't mean anything. This i, okay. So I mean, for example, well, I'm just saying that, uh, for example, 0, 1 is equivalent to up 1, and 1, 1 is the same as writing down 1. If this is confusing, I can just write up and down, just because I would like to write something general. But it's not, uh, it's not necessary. So what I mean is that you, you choose your basis, hmm, your complete basis of your first spin which is 0, 1, 
one one, and maybe if okay you have more complicated system, you can have also other base other other elements. In this case, you have just two, and then you you write this expression. Problems with this? No. Okay. So this is the meaning of this expression, trace over the first p. Now let's see the meaning of the second expression. We have the trace over one, two, of, now we have our density matrix row. Now we have our, our observable that acts only on the first pin. This is equal to the sum over, now we have to consider the basis both of the first pin and of the second spin. So now the basis are here, we have that the basis is this one. In the other case, we have that the basis i1, j2, where i and j can run over all the, the eigenstates, or all the, all the, of the elements of the basis of the first and second spins. So now we have to sum over i and j, and we have a generic state written in this form. i1, j2, rho, o1, times identity on the second space. Then you have uh, here uh, i, i1, j2. OK? This is just the definition of the, of the trace. Hmm? Now, as you see, this operator acts non trivial only on the state i1. So this means that uh, we can actually already compute, we can, we can move this operator outside of this expectation by respect to the, to the state corresponding to the spin, to the first spin. So what I mean is that you can write this in this form, sum over i of i1, i1, and then you have this expression to j, j2, rho, one, rho, uh, where is it, where is it, j2, oh, I forgot something, sorry, sum over j of j2, uh, rho, j2. Yes? Uh, uh, one and two means that they is referring to the first spin or the second spin. Yeah, the, the identity acts only on the second spin. We are considering the operator that acts, that acts like uh, O1 on the first spin and like identity on the other spin, okay? But then what I mean because, okay, this operator only acts on the first spin, so it, it doesn't, well, it doesn't act, in, it doesn't change the second, uh, uh, the second, uh, the second element of the base is the, the second uh, vector. So this means that we can actually write the expression in this way. Okay. Problems, please. Hmm. Now we see that we accomplished our our goal, no? Because we wanted to write the, the what is it? We wanted to find this operator row one in such a way that the, 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 uh, the trace of the operator times the observable is equal as this form, okay? And now we, uh, is equal to this, sorry. We want to find this, and now this is what we obtain. If we identify this operator by row one. Okay, here everything is an observable. You should put that everywhere. Okay, so what is this object? And moreover, okay, uh, how do we call it? We call it partial trace. So it means that the, this density matrix of the sphere spin, they would like to define, is defined as the trace over the second spin of the original density matrix. And with this, Partial trace, I mean exactly this one. So I have to, uh, I have to uh, construct a complete basis of the second space, 
and then I complete uh, and I compute these expectation values. Uh, just uh, before questions, how do you do this in practice? Because maybe it can, it's a, it can be a bit confusing now when you consider partial traces. So let's uh, let's understand what I mean. The <clears throat> The density operator is an operator on the, uh, on the space of two spins, okay? As such operator can be written in terms of the Pauli matrices of the first and second spin. So this means that you can write the density operator in, in a form like this, alpha sigma 1x, sigma 2x, plus beta sigma 1x, sigma 2y, and so on. You can expand. Where here, I mean, okay, the other is identity one, identity two, which is the identity of both spin. You can expand this operator. Now, what I mean when I compute a partial trace? So let's assume that we, we compute a partial, hmm? we compute the partial trace of this operator. It means that I have to compute this sum over J. I should put a complete basis in the second space of sigma and compute the expectation value of this operator, the complete basis. Hmm? Because this is a completely, uh, this act on a different space, I can write this as sum over j, I can move this outside, okay, of the expectation value, so I have this equal to sigma 1x, j2, sigma 2x, j2. Then you realize that this is nothing but a trace on the second space, so this is equal sigma 1x trace, second space, or sigma 2x. We know that the trace of spins is always equal to zero. Why is this so? Well, it's because of the algebra, as a matter of fact, because we know that spin have uh, this property, as I wrote before, epsilon i, j, k, s, k. Now if you take trace of both member, then realize that the trace of a commutator is equal to zero. So this means that the trace of the spin is equal to zero. Spin operator. So what, well, it's not important. What I mean is that we know, even without uh, writing a representation in terms of polymerisis, that the trace of this object is equal to zero. So for example, so this means that the trace over the second spin of sigma 1x, sigma 2x, is equal to zero. This is what you should do in practice. So which are the, the, the observables that have a non-zero trace? Well, the only one where on the second, uh, the, the second part of the operator is, uh, is proportional to the identity. So you can consider any observable of this form, okay. sigma one, identity two. And then if you consider a partial trace on the second spin, then you have to compute the trace of the identity. And so you find in this particular case, which is equal to twice the twice sigma one y. So this is what I mean with partial trace in a practical way. Is it clear? No? Okay. Uh, what is the... You, you didn't get the partial trace. Okay, so the... So, let's see. Mm. So you, ah, the second line. Ah, okay, no, the second line is fine, okay. We can, we can see it explicitly, no problem. So let's assume we want to compute this, which is another observable. So we have to compute again sum over j of j, sigma 1x, identity on the second, the operator, the, the operator x like an identity on the second spin. Now, as before, this act on a different space, so we can move outside without, this is completely transparent to this operator, the vector, because act on a different space. So we have this equal to sigma 1x, j2, identity, j2. Hmm? Okay. Identity. This is just the norm of the uh, of the base. Okay, so this just counts the number of elements in the basis. 
in particular because we have spin one half here, we have two elements. And so this is equal to twice sigma one x. Okay. And these are the only operators with a non-zero partial trace on the second spin that you can compute, the one with, a, with an identity here. Because all the other, if you put some uh, uh, spin operator here, you always find zero trace. This is practical. Is okay now? What I mean, partial trace, more or less, I hope so. And uh, uh, okay, so we discovered that uh, we can we can describe our subsystem because okay, one spin is a subsystem of uh, two spins by means of uh, an effective density operator, which acts only on the first spin on the on the subsystem. So here there are no more degrees of freedom. Uh, related to the rest of the system. So we just say, we don't know what happens outside because I can't measure uh, what is outside. So I, I only care about my subsystem. And so I, 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 I describe my, my subsystem using a density matrix. And this is how you do it. And this is called reduced density matrix. because it's reduced to the subsystem you are interested in. So the general rule is that let's assume that you have space. The entire space can be split in two parts. Let's say parts A and the parts B, okay? And then you, you are interested in, uh, for example, this can be, let's assume that we have some spins, many spins. Hmm? And you say, okay, I can only measure these three spins. I cannot measure the other two. So this becomes my subsystem A. And this is what I call B. Because I'm interested in this, then I say, okay, I, I don't care about uh, what's outside. And I can I describe my state using a reduced density matrix, which is defined as the trace over the, uh, the rest of the system of my original density matrix. You can check that this satisfies all the, uh, all the, uh, satisfies all the, all the properties of the density matrix. So the trace, well, it's, it's simple to verify that the trace of this object is equal to one, because if you take the trace over A of row A, is the trace over A of the trace over B, of raw, but this is nothing but the trace over the entire space. The trace over the entire space of raw, which was equal to one originally, so it also equal to one now. So this reduced density matrix has unitary trace. Still, you can easily show that it has eigenvalues between zero and one. Okay, and in particular, if we go back to our original problem, just to, to do it explicitly, so that we understand whether we understood something or not. Uh, let's do the calculation in that case. Okay. <clears throat> so we were considering our state was this one, psi zero was equal to minus one third, up, up, plus two third, down, up, plus two third, down, down. Hmm? So now the question is, what is the density matrix, of the reduced density matrix of the first spin, the first spin? Hmm? So first of all, what I have to do? I have to construct the density matrix associated with this state. This is a pure state. So the density matrix is the projector on the state. So we start from the density matrix, which is the project on this state, which is equal to minus one third up, up plus two third down up plus two third down down times minus one third up plus two-thirds, up, down, up, 
plus third down down yes side zero is a pure state yes this is why I can write the density matrix as a projector on that state this was the state so I wrote so you have problems with the notation with This is not a mixed state, this is a standard uh, pure state. Because, okay, for, in order to be a pure state, you should check it's uh, normalized. So a pure state is just a superposition, quantum superposition of different states. So here, each one of these is a state. And this is a, this is not a, a superposition of pure states. This is a pure state, pure, pure state. You can check this uh, just a little. Your state. It's a quantum mechanical state. So you have a superposition. This means that you have the the, the spin can be uh, in the uh, can be in the in the state up 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 down or down down with a given probability. But this is a quantum superposition. It's not a classical superposition. This is it is described by this this quantum state. Okay. Hmm? Because it's a pure state, this is the density matrix projector on the pure state. This has this form explicitly. And now we want to compute the trace over the, the second spin. What do we do? The tracing means that we should actually consider, we should do this kind of calculation. We should row one is equal to up second spin times row up second spin plus down second spin, row down second spin. This is what we have to compute. Hmm? Now here how many, we have nine terms to consider. Hmm? And uh, so we know when we, are, when we act with, uh, when we consider the scalar product between a up in the second spin and the state here is down on the second spin, that we find zero, they are orthogonal. The only way to find something on zero is when also here you have up. Hmm? So this means that this term is equal to what? This term. Uh, we have a contribution from this one hmm? because the second spin is up. So we have two up spin. Then you have this, which is minus one third up, up. We have a contribution from this one. Hmm? And you, uh, we have zero contribution from this one. The same here. OK? So in practice, what do we find? If we do this, we find that when you compute this term for this, the, the first term, then we find minus or we find 1 over 9 times, we, we have to compute something like this, up second spin. And the operator is up, up. Up, 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 second spin. When we consider this color product here, this is equal to one times the cat up of the first spin. So we have that this is equal to up, first spin, up, second, uh, up, first spin for this particular term. Then we have to consider also this term with this term. For example, if you consider this term, what we have? We should compute, for example, up. And we have here up, up, second spin. And here we have down, up. Hmm? What is this? Again, this is equal to 1 times the cat up on the, second, on the first spin. So this is equal to up, first spin. And then here you have down, third first spin. This is what we have to do for all the terms. Is it boring? Yes. No. Uh, in this particular case, it can be boring. Also because let's assume that instead of having just two spins, I have uh, 10,000 spins. Uh, yeah. And uh, I'm interested only in the first spin. So it can be difficult no, to, to carry out this calculation. So maybe there's a better way 
to do this, at least when the, the, the subsystem is small with respect to the total system. So we can do this if you want, and I can also write the result because I wrote it here. So we, we, if you do this calculation and do it, because well, it's usable, so you find identity, mine, or maybe you don't read it. So the final result is, is identity minus 4 over 9 sigma 1x minus 7 over 9 sigma 1z over 2. Okay. Uh, sorry? This is the reduced density matrix of the first pin. This is just the result. When you carry out this calculation, this is what you find. But now I show you another way to, to compute the same. That in some situation can be convenient. Not always, but in some cases. So, uh, yes. Generally, it's okay, depending on the system, we will consider quantum many body system. This is a hard problem to compute the reduced density matrix of a subsystem. And this is why I'm, uh, I'm telling you different approaches. Because, okay, it's, uh, in, in some simple cases, you can. In some simple cases, you have uh, maybe access not to the entire density matrix, but only on some properties. For example, you well, we'll see you can have access to some eigenvalues of the density matrix. And maybe it's more complicated to have everything. And uh, so it's generally a, a big problem. But, uh, but considering the entire state can be even more complicated in many cases. And it's useless because you don't, uh, uh, this is some information you, do, you don't need to consider. So we, we should try to remove the information we don't need. Okay, okay so uh, how can we obtain this result in a simple, maybe in a different way, not simple. In this case it's equivalent. Matter of fact. And uh, well, the alternative way is to use that the density matrix is completely uh, determined by the expectation values of the observables. Hmm? So before I show you that uh, given the density matrix, you can compute all the expectation values, you can actually do the opposite. Given all the expectation values, you can reconstruct density matrix. And now I show you this, uh, uh, this alternative way focusing on spin one half chains. So you have just spin one half Pauli matrices. You have uh, many, many spins. And you are interested in the density matrix of some subsystem of the spins. So. So the situation is that you have uh, many spin from 1 to n, let's say. Then you, you describe your system using some density matrix, whatever. Then you are interested only in a part of your system, which is denoted by, well, uh, we, we can just order the spin in such a way that the, we, we, start from, we start counting from the spin inside the, our subsystem, such a way that you consider just the, the speeds from one to small n here, which is our, our subsystem A, and here we have the rest B. Okay, so we describe the entire system by row, and we are interested in the reduced density matrix in A. So it's, uh, it's simple to prove that this can be written in this form. One over two to the n sum over all the operator that you can construct with the spins, which are string of Pauli matrices. So what I mean is that you consider uh, alpha one, alpha 
n, which is equal to, it goes from 0 to 4. Now, just a moment, then you take here the expectation value of sigma alpha 1, sigma alpha n, and here you have sigma 1 alpha 1, sigma n alpha n. I think this is correct, I guess. What is this? I introduced the, this object uh, at the beginning of the lecture. So I told you that I define sigma 0 as the identity. And then sigma 1, 2, 3 are the Pauli matrices. So here I'm summing over all the possible operators that you can construct in the subsystem. There is, uh, oh, you, you are perfectly right, thanks. Yeah. Because you're from 0. So you have uh, sigma 0 is identity, and uh, sigma 3 is uh, sigma z. So you sum over all the operators that you can construct. <laughs> and uh, uh, so what, uh, what you can see here is that the reduced end symmetry is the is a linear combination of all these operators. You can expect this because we, we are considered a complete basis of operators in, uh, in the space. But now the coefficients, we know also the coefficients. The coefficients are the expectation values of this operator in the original density matrix. Why is this the case? Well, you can immediately prove it because let's assume that you, you, want, to, you want to compute the expectation value of some observable, which is a string of Pauli matrices, for example. Hmm? Sigma, uh, let's do it in this way, uh, just a particular example, let's consider. Sigma 1x, sigma 2y, and let's assume then uh, that uh, n is equal to 2, for example, just for, okay, just for example. Then you can, plug this expression inside the trace. So you have to consider trace over A of uh, one, okay, of sigma one x, oh, that is rho A here. Hmm? Sigma one x, uh, there is one over two n, two to the n times all the sum over all the operators of the trace of rho. Well, let's write this in the short, short notations sum over all the operators that are string of Pauli matrices, times the trace of rho times the operator times O. Now times sigma 1, sigma x, sigma 2, y. We have to compute this, for example. No? But now, when you consider the a generic string of Pauli matrices times this sigma 1x, sigma 2y, what do you find? Generally, you find something which has some Pauli matrix inside, for example. Let's assume that the O is uh, something like this, sigma 1, sigma 3, z. This is a possible operator, no? When we multiply sigma 3, z times this, we have a string of Pauli matrices. But when we consider the trace of a string of spins or Pauli matrices, we find always zero. Because it is sufficient to have a single Pauli matrix to make the trace equal to zero, for what I showed you before. Maybe this is not clear, but if you, if you consider the trace of, of an operator which acts only on one times an operator which acts only on two, this is equal to the product of the traces. Hmm? So this means that this is enough to have a Pauli matrix here to make the trace equal to zero for that particular term. So the only possibility to cancel this operator, is that here we have a sigma 1x, a sigma 2y, because the, the Pauli matrix is square to 1. So we have that sigma, sigma j squared is equal always to the identity. Yes? Yeah, uh, this is the total. Yeah, yeah, this is the trace over the entire space. And here uh, you maybe it's also better to put also the other degree of freedom. This is an identity over the rest of the space. Which is completely equivalent to, to take the trace over the subsystem A and remove this identity. No, 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 sorry, 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 sorry. This is a mistake. This is a trace over A, because otherwise I have to change the normalization. 
okay? So this is actually the, oh, this is row A. This is not row of the entire system. We can do the same, uh, okay, there was this uh, typos, so if I write row here, then I have to put all the identities here. Then the problem is that I have to take into account the, the trace of the identities, so the normalization is wrong. It becomes capital N instead of uh, small n. Okay. But okay, this is the, the expression that I would like to, to use before, okay, row A. Yes? Yes. These are n plus one. No. Yeah. Here yeah, they are from one to n. There is no. Maybe I confuse it with the, with this environment. You can actually what? Uh, forget about uh, the space B and just consider the subsystem with the, the the system with the given density matrix. Okay. So what I mean is that when you consider this kind of traces, because every element is orthogonal to the other element in the, uh, using the trace as, uh, uh, with respect to the trace, then we are selecting just that particular observable equal to the observable that we want to compute here. And when we select the observable, we have the expectation value. So why can this be useful? Well, because, well, if the, your subsystem A is small, for example, it's one spin, and the entire system is uh, two to the 10 spins, which is 1,000, anyway, 1,000 spin, then you, instead of uh, having to compute, to consider uh, one million terms here, you can just compute three expectation values, sigma one x, sigma two x, sigma three, uh, sigma one x, sigma one y, and sigma one z. Yes? No. This expression is correct in this way, okay, with row A. If you, if you want to write what you are thinking, then you could rewrite this as row A is equal one over two to the capital N of sum over alpha one alpha n from zero to three of the trace over the entire system of rho sigma one alpha one sigma n alpha n. And then you have here the identity on the rest. And here you have sigma one alpha one sigma n alpha n. But this is kind of, uh, well, useless. it's not really deeper. What I mean is that, but if you want to compute this partial trace, you have to take into account uh, the entire state, no? So in particular, if you have something like this, you have to compute uh, many, many terms. What I mean here is that you can avoid it, in a sense. And instead of computing all this contribution, you can just focus on uh, the expectation values of the observables inside the subsystem, like here. So you have just a bunch of expectation values to compute. Hmm? For example, for one spin, we have three observables to compute, and we can construct the density matrix of one spin. Yes, okay. Let's, uh, uh, ah, from the partial trace, so, so it's possible, actually. Because we can, uh, if a, Let's assume that this is, uh, uh, this is now instead of row A, let's put here row. And here put N. Because we have an, an analogous expansion for the total density matrix, okay? Now let's assume this, then I will come back to your question, why is this expression, this correct expression. Okay, let's assume that this is the case. Now we want to compute rho restricted to a subsystem A, so the reduced density matrix, rho A. Then we have to trace over B, this expression. Oh, this is N now. We have to trace over B. So we have a trace over B of rho. Now we have here, which is equal one over two to the N. You have the sum 
over alpha 1, alpha n from 0 to 3 of, oh God, okay, uh, of uh, the trace of uh, rho sigma 1, alpha 1, sigma n, alpha n. And then you have to compute the trace over B of the string of Pauli matrices. Right? Now the trace over B is non zero. All if here you have alpha equal to zero. So in order to be non zero here, okay, this is different from zero if and only if, if and only if n plus n plus one n, oh, no, sorry, alpha, alpha n plus one equal alpha n plus two equal alpha n is equal to zero. Because it is enough to have a one, one spin to, to make this trace equal to zero. So this means that the, here you have to consider only the terms with this property. And when you compute the trace, you get the dimension of the space, of the space of B. So you, have, you find two to the capital N minus, minus small n. So this is exactly equal to one over two to the N times the sum of alpha one, alpha small n, and then you have all the, alpha, the other alpha equal to zero, so I don't have to sum. And you have the trace of rho sigma one alpha one, sigma n alpha n, and then you have all the identity here. And here you obtain two to the capital N minus n, which is the trace of the identities, times the trace or uh, times, sorry, there is no trace now, sigma one alpha one, sigma one alpha small n. You see that this is exactly the expression that I wrote before. And then now two to the capital N minus N divided two to the N is one over two to the small n. And we have the same, and the, 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 we use here that the trace of the operator with an identity on B are just given by the trace of reduced density matrix on A times the operator, acting only on the first base. And we obtain the previous expression. This is just, just to show you that there is consistency in what I'm telling you. So if you assume that this is correct for the total density matrix, then it's also correct for the reduced density matrix. Now, why is it correct? The reason is that the, if you consider this basis of operator, so all the string of polymerases, they are orthogonal with respect to the trace. So if you have, uh, if you consider two elements with a different alpha somewhere, this is a base in the space of the operator. So if you consider this kind of, uh, a, every element of this base can be represented by the string of the alpha. And then you have this, uh, which can be zero, one, or three, one, three, or whatever. If you find two elements which are different here, you find zero, and the reason is that when you multiply two Pauli matrices with a different index, you find something proportional to the Pauli matrix, the Pauli matrix, but the Pauli matrix has zero trace. So these are equal to, uh, so, so if you consider this, the trace of two different strings with different um, sets of alpha, you find zero. And if you consider the, the, the trace of the operator times itself, yeah, you find one, because the square of a Pauli matrix is equal to one. Well, it's not really a change. I just chose a particular basis, a convenient basis here. It, I, I chose a basis that has the nice property that all the elements are orthogonal, with, orthonormal with respect to the to the trace of uh, this kind of product in the operators. Uh, okay, for for spins, yes. In uh, well. In general, uh, I don't know. It's not always possible. Okay, this is possible when you have a, a, a finite, mm, I think a bounded space in the, the local space. So here we have a spin with a finite number of states. Yeah, every time that you have this kind of structure, it's okay. In general, either I don't know, uh, I, I don't know if it is useful and I don't even know whether it's possible. It's not possible. But at least for spin system, you can. 
And this can be convenient because, okay, in our case now we could solve the same problem, just say, oh, well, I know that the row one is nothing but the identity divided by two, which gives you a trace, a unitary trace of the density matrix. And then you have to put here all the expectation value, or everything divided by two, sigma one x plus sigma two x, sigma two x. Oh, no, you know what is this? this one, one, y, y, plus sigma one z, sigma one z. So you compute these three expectation values in this state and you find the result. Yeah. These are kind of, uh, I, uh, so these methods are completely equivalent in this case, but maybe in some, uh, in some cases it could be convenient to use one or the other. Okay. Um, okay, uh, so we started a bit late, so I can continue another five, 10 minutes, I guess. Okay. Is it at least clear uh, that you, when, you, when you consider a subsystem, in general you find, you cannot describe the subsystem using a pure state, but you have to describe it using a density matrix. And the reason is that you are, uh, you, are you, uh, you miss some information of the state. You lack the information about the rest of the system when you construct, when you consider just a part. And for this reason, so you, you, the state will not generally be pure, but you have to deal with the, with a mixed state. Okay, now I would like to draw a, uh, a correspondence between this formalism, density matrix formalism, and classical statistical mechanics. Okay, in uh, uh, in classical physics, you can okay. Let's just uh, can I can I erase everything? So when you consider a classical system, what you of uh, maybe many particles, hmm, what you have, you you generally uh, can uh, uh, you define the state as a point in the in the phase space, okay? So you you have some uh, coordinates, hmm, canonical coordinates Q and P, position of, for example, momentum of all the particles, and then your let's assume that these are all the coordinates of all the particles, all the degrees of freedom, and this is a conjugate momentum, hmm? okay? And then your state is just a point in this plot, which corresponds to a particular value of Q and P, okay? Now, uh, what happens, if, for example, when you consider the time evolution, then you have some, these points start moving in the phase space. Is this clear to you or not? You. Okay, this is what you, what you see in a uh, uh, classical system. Uh, well, what happens when you instead consider a statistical classical system? That instead of considering just uh, a single point, then you, you describe some uh, fluid in this phase space. And so you, you describe instead of uh, just the motion of a single point, you just consider, okay, there is a probability, some, some probability that the, the state is here, there is a different probability, or maybe here or here, and then all this state, all these all this points just move with the time, so this change the distribution. So instead of describing the state by fixing the value of Q of P, you just introduce a distribution function. And you say, well, I introduce rho, a classical distribution function, which is a function of my uh, coordinate, canonical coordinates, and maybe also the time, some point. Q, so Q, P, and also the time, okay, it will be. And then you, and for example, if you just consider a single, um, if you know everything about, about, you know everything about your state, so this means that it just, uh, it's just equivalent to say that the, my, my distribution is a Dirac delta function, where you say that all the, all the coordinates are, fixed to a given value. Hmm? 
So this means this is just a point. If we just consider point in phase space, it's equivalent to say, okay, I have a, this distribution is completely picked on the point. But in general, you say, okay, maybe I, uh, in statistical system, you don't know the position and the velocity of all the particles. Clearly, it's impossible because you have too many particles. So the only thing that you can know, you, you know with some probabilities uh, the, uh, where the system is. And so this means that instead of working with uh, just the standard uh, formalism, uh, Hamiltonian, uh, Lagrangian formalism for the, single, for the motion of a single point in the phase space, you have to take into account the motion of the fluid, of distribution function, the change of the distribution function in the, in the phase space. This is what happens in, in uh, classical physics. And which are the properties of this, uh, uh, of this distribution, classical distribution? Well, first of all, it's normalized to one. It's a distribution function. So the total probability should be equal to one. So when you consider the integral over the entire phase space of, of this classical distribution, should be equal to one. To describe the probability. Then uh, if you want to compute the expectation value of some observable, so what is the expectation value in classical physics? It's just a function of your variable, Q and P. So you, if you want to compute the, the, the mean value of some observable, which is just a function of Q and P, what you have to do is just to write the mean value over this distribution. D and P, rho classical, Q, P, and you have this function of the observer. Okay? So this is what you do when you have the uh, distribution function in this phase space to compute the mean value. For example, this could be the energy of the, of the system. So it will be something like P squared over 2M, sum over all the particles plus some, plus some potential, you have to compute this kind of uh, mean value over this distribution. Okay. You see that there is some, uh, seems to be, that there is some analogy with, uh, with the density matrix. <laughs> Indeed, if we, if you use some correspondence principle, when we replace these quantities by observables, as we usually do in quantum mechanics, so you take your classical quantities and you replace them with uh, the corresponding operators, hmm, quantum operator, then you replace the integral over the phase space with a trace over the quantum space. And then you realize that here, well, we are writing nothing else but the well, rules to compute expectation values satisfied by the density matrix. So the correspondence principle in this case is equivalent to say that you replace your classical distribution in phase space by the density matrix of the system. And so in this way, you can recover all the results known from uh, uh, thermodynamics, from statistical physics. For example, if you, if you consider a system in equilibrium at a given temperature, you know that this, the classical distribution function, it's a function of Q and P, is proportional to the exponential of minus the inverse temperature, okay. KT, and then here you have the energy, which is a function of Q and P. This is the Gibbs distribution, the canonical distribution. This is what you find in classical in statistical physics. Now we have the same here. So what happens if you use the correspondence principle and you realize that now the rho, the density matrix, is proportional to the exponential of minus one over Boltzmann constant times the temperature, and here you put the Hamilton. So you see, so we, we can we can obtain the same the same results uh, valid in classical physics just by replacing the operators, the the, the the classical quantities with the operators in general. Okay. So, but in particular, we can also define the entropy of the system. The entropy of the system classically is defined as the as the mean value of the Shannon entropy of the distribution rho. So when you define the entropy up to a, well, up to some additive constant, the entropy is uh, 
equal to classically. Classical entropy is, uh, well, some constant mm, plus the integral over the over the phase space of minus the logarithm of the classical distribution times rho classical of q p. This is what we have in statistical physics. And now what happens in, uh, if you want to expand, to, to, to generalize the expression in the, in the quantum domain, then we have just to replace the, again, integral over space space by the, uh, by the trace and the classical distribution by the, um, the density matrix. So what we find that now the entropy is defined as minus trace ah, of rho logarithm of rho. This is the definition of the entropy in the quantum case. Okay, okay now I think it's, uh, it's late enough, maybe we'll, uh, we'll finish tomorrow. Okay. okay, any question about this? 